in the case of Henry McCabe, we have more questions than we have answers. We have a puzzle with a lot of pieces that just don't fit together. A truer statement has never been spoken about the case that I have for you today. Storyline for this strange true crime case reads like a cross between Days of Our Lives, Murder She Wrote, and Bridezilla. We got a crazy, obsessed wife, a cheating husband, confidential informants, and even civil war. This is actually an official missing 411 case, but the one piece of evidence that put it on the radar for the in-between is the final voicemail recording from this man, which sounds like something straight out of hell. This is the case of Henry McCabe. Now, in my humble opinion, this case is a hot mess. And unfortunately for Henry, it's a cold, hot mess. And yes, this is another case from Minnesota. But what can I say? We have a lot of weird things happening here. So let's start with the things that seem to be pretty established fact. Henry McCabe was a 31-year-old Liberian immigrant who fled his homeland after their years-long civil war. He lived in a northern suburb of Minneapolis called Moundsview. He had a wife, Kareen, whom he'd been married to for 11 years, and two beautiful daughters. That is a fact. They are adorable. He was an auditor for the Minnesota Department of Revenue and was an active and respected member of the Minnesota Liberian community, who was even thinking about returning to Liberia to enter their political scene. More on that part later. But for the most part, just a regular guy. His wife, Kareen, was in California over Labor Day weekend 2015. So Henry decided to have a little fun. On Sunday, September 6th, 2015, he goes to a barbecue and meets up with an acquaintance by the name of William Kennedy. The two men leave the party somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock with the intent to go out clubbing that night. But first, William follows Henry to his house where they hang out for just a little while. Finally, Henry says, hey, can I get a ride to the club? William says, fine and takes Henry to the club. The club is named Pavlitsky's, but there's something special they got going on on Sunday nights where they call it C'est la vie. I don't know. On the way there, they stop at an ATM so Henry can take out $200 at exactly 11.24 p.m. Then, on to the club. Once they got there, William says Henry spent most of the time hanging out with another friend of theirs called Jonathan Thomas, or JT for short. Henry even gave JT his wallet for the evening, I guess to make up for some favor that he owed JT, I think he forgot his birthday or something. But when it's time to go home, William goes out to his car to find Henry there waiting for a ride home. As the two men get in the car, Henry is on the phone in what sounds like an argument with who William assumes was Henry's wife, Kareen. William starts to drive slowly out of the parking lot, but he's waiting for Henry to get off the phone because he doesn't know exactly where Henry lives. He needs Henry to give him some directions. Once Henry finally hung up on whomever it was he was talking to, William's like, dude, I need some directions. And Henry tells William, don't worry, just drop me at the gas station. And William says, well, why would I do that? And Henry says, it's okay, just drop me at the gas station. I'm going to be fine. This whole area It's my area. So William drops Henry off at a Super America gas station on Highway 65 around 2 a.m. And then he goes straight home. The last time William sees Henry, he's walking to the side of the gas station. And William says he was more than willing to give Henry a ride home. And he doesn't really know why Henry insisted on being dropped off at the gas station, which he evidently didn't even go in. At 2.28 a.m., Henry calls his wife, Kareen. Kareen says she could not understand a word that he was saying, but it was really obvious that something was wrong. So thinking quickly, she conferences in Henry's brother, Tim Borber. Tim doesn't answer his phone, so the call rolls to his voicemail, which ends up recording one of the most disturbing pieces of audio that you hopefully will ever hear. The call is about two minutes in length, and I'm going to play the entire clip. And I know that's a really big chunk of time, but when I was listening to it to try to cut it down, 
I couldn't figure out where to cut it. And I just think that you need to hear the whole thing to get an idea of just how massive the warning flags should have been. The small clips that you hear on the internet just don't do it justice. And please be warned that some people might find this clip very disturbing. Corrine filed a missing persons report the next day with the Moundsview Police Department. She told police that she had spoken with JT, who told her that Henry left the club around 1.50 a.m. and had gotten a ride home with William. So William is where the police started. William tells his story and the police go to the Super America station and pull the surveillance footage to verify his account. But the footage doesn't show Henry being dropped off at that gas station. Kareen supplies investigators with snapshots of Henry's Google timeline showing the path that his phone took that night. And while driving through the area, police see that there's another gas station, a holiday station, about three miles south of the Super America that they had already checked. So they go to the holiday station and check that camera footage just to see if maybe that was the gas station that they went to. And sure enough, there is a car that looks like William's car dropping off a guy that looks like Henry at 1.58 a.m. Now, the police also pulled Henry's phone records. And yes, his phone pings around that same time in that area. But no further signs of Henry. He is just poof gone. Fast forward to November 2nd, two months after Henry has vanished. A kayaker on Rush Lake in New Brighton, Minnesota, 3.5 miles to the east of where Henry was last seen and two miles south of his apartment, finds a body that is eventually identified through dental records as that of Henry McCabe. He was found with his cell phone in his right pants pocket and the battery in the left pants pocket. $15, enough for a cab fare if you wanted to do that, his wedding ring, and a VIP wristband from a club. Makes sense. The autopsy apparently discovered no signs of foul play. There's no gunshot wounds, there's no stab wounds, no bruising, no injuries, nothing. However, the body was so decomposed and covered in algae that when the officers pulled him out of the water, they could not tell by looking at the body what race it is or even if it was a male or female. So it seems to me that it is possible that some proof of some injuries may have been lost to nature. 
Liver analysis showed that Henry's blood alcohol content was about 0.053. So yes, he had been drinking, but he wasn't stumbling drunk. But no obvious cause of death could be determined. So the coroner ruled it as a probable drowning in fresh water. At this point, the Moundsview PD missing persons case is handed over to the New Brighton PD, and the case remains open to this day, pending new information going forward. And that is pretty much the end of what we know. Not much. So let's take a trip down the theory iceberg into murkier territory. Here is where things start going murder she wrote. Theory number one was an accident. Henry was very drunk and just wandered into the water by himself. First, Henry's family said he could swim. And dismissing the fact that walking over three and a half miles over an hour is bound to make anybody sober up quite a bit. But let's go with the idea that he's too drunk to figure it out and that the sounds on the voicemail are the sounds of a drowning man. Well, how did he manage to walk the three and a half miles in the 30 minute time span between when he was dropped off and when the voicemail was recorded? He would have had to have been booking it to make that happen. Not likely if he was stumbling drunk. That would also mean that Henry would have had to walk around another lake to get to Rush Lake. If he's gonna stumble into a lake, wouldn't he stumble into the first lake that's in his path? Not to mention the fact that he would have to tromp through rough terrain to get to the water's edge on Rush Lake. Take a listen to this video, which is from a prayer service held in the spot that Henry was discovered, and pay particular attention to the sounds that are being made by people's feet as they all try to gather as close to the water's edge as they can. And notice they're not even at the water's edge yet. That seems like it would be pretty hard to just stumble into that water. But not according to police. The investigator said he, and I quote, found it would be highly probable Henry would wind up in Rush Lake from his prior location. If Henry had kept walking down Rice Creek Road, he would have come to a T-intersection at Long Lake Road. He would have followed Long Lake and Mississippi around Long Lake, which would end in a series of trails between Long Lake and Rush Lake. End quote. Seriously, let's take a listen to that statement one more time while we follow along on a map. If Henry had kept walking down Rice Creek Road, he would have come to a T-intersection at Long Lake Road. He could have followed Long Lake and Mississippi around Long Lake, which ended in a series of trails between Long Lake and Rush Lake. Assuming Henry was really trying to get home, and assuming he was at least somewhat familiar with the area, and assuming that after walking three and a half miles, and I think these are all really good assumptions, he's not stumbling drunk anymore. And given the choice between staying on paved roads or heading down lakeside pathways, wouldn't you choose the road? He had to know that going down the paths wasn't taking him in the direction of his home. Now, that's totally my opinion, but I find the accident theory just really hard to swallow. Theory number two, a wild animal such as a wolf or a coyote scared Henry into the water where he drowned. This could explain some of the weird noises on the voicemail, but again, not likely. This area is located on the outer ring of the Minneapolis-St. Paul suburbs, but it's still pretty industrial area. We don't have many reports of large predator animals in the burbs. I did see an entry on websleuths.com mention that deer can make some pretty crazy noises if they're startled, and we certainly have a lot of deer in this area, but it's not like Henry would have stumbled across his deer that he would have felt the need to run for his life and accidentally run into the lake. And I doubt that that kind of an incident would last the entire two minutes of the voicemail recording. 
no startled deer is going to stick around that long. And the coroner found no evidence of any bite marks or scratches on the body. So that kind of rules out any other large predator like a wolf or a coyote. And don't forget to circle back to theory one and ask how did he get the three and a half miles to the lakeside in just 30 minutes? Theory number three, Bigfoot. Sorry, my BFFs, but this one's just not likely. The closest sighting I can find is from 1988. And the most recent one that is anywhere close to the metro area is pretty far east along the Mississippi River. The area that Henry is in is pretty well cleared out. Not the kind of area where most Bigfoot sightings occur. Theory number four, suicide. Henry's brother, Timothy, who also filed a missing persons report on September 8th, told police that Henry had no history of depression or mental health issues. But it is also reported that he had just had a bad review at work and was possibly behind on rent. Co-workers also stated that he was occasionally emotional over some family issues, but he never mentioned anything specific. But let's look at that map again. If Henry wanted to drown himself, why not do it in the first body of water that he would have come to? Why walk all the way around one lake just to throw yourself in the next one? And why would you be on the phone while you're drowning yourself? I don't think so. Theory number five, the Liberia connection. Here's where things start to get spicy. Apparently, Henry's dad was a politician in Liberia who was assassinated, poisoned, which forced Henry and his brothers to flee the country where they would be forced to remain in exile. Corrine told police that Henry had been offered a job in the Liberian government. She said it was his goal to eventually return to Liberia and run for president, but he wanted to finish his master's degree in accounting and get his CPA license and save up some more money first. The Liberian community, roughly 25,000 strong in Minnesota, has suggested that his death could be linked to the political mess that they have going on back home. Now, the Mounds View police, along with an FBI agent, had a conversation with a confidential informant, or CI for short, at the Mounds View Police Department. The CI said he'd been friends with Henry for a long time and that they talked a lot lately about his political aspirations back in Liberia. He also said that he was at the search party gathering on Saturday, September 12th, and he noticed four males standing together away from the group, kind of chatting amongst themselves. In the group was Kennedy White, not to be confused with William Kennedy, Jala Kessely, Kelvin Johnson, and Emmanuel D., the guy who had the barbecue at his house that Henry went to. When the CI starts walking over to the group, they're talking together, and as he gets closer, the group, they kind of quiet down and split up. Well, he goes to Kennedy White and says, I know what happened to my friend. And Kennedy White responds with, I was in Connecticut. The CI then says that later that same day, he called Jala Kessley, who basically said, I wasn't there, keep me out of it. And he talked to Kelvin Johnson. Kelvin Johnson says, I'm not talking about this over the phone. The CI also called Emmanuel D, the guy that had the barbecue. And he says, what happened at your barbecue? And Emmanuel said, I am not going to be involved and I'm not going to talk about it. The CI says to Emmanuel, talking about William Kennedy, your friend killed my friend and I want to know why. And later, Emmanuel's brother, J.R., calls the confidential informant and says that they can't discuss this on the phone, but he'll meet him face to face on Saturday to talk about it. And the CI says, Sure. Now, apparently, the same day that he's talking to police, the CI got a call from Calvin Johnson, who asked him, why are you saying William killed Henry? And the CI said, I'm saying it because it's true and you know it. 
The CI also heard that message that Henry left on Corrine's voicemail. And he says that in the beginning, Henry is yelling that he is from Lofa County, which is where he's from in Liberia. And that later in the recording, Henry says that he has Vu in an attempt to tell other people around that they will be possessed by a demon if they hurt him. He then says that at the end of the recording is Henry screaming for help. The confidential informant says he believes that Henry is dead and he wants his friend to have a proper burial. So what's up with this little meeting of the minds there? It sure sounds like somebody knows something. Henry was supposedly a pretty prominent guy back in Liberia and had stated to friends that he wanted to go back and jump into politics just like his dad. Did the wrong people get wind of that? Some people will do pretty much anything to get rid of their political enemies. Lovetta Tugba from Coalition for Justice in Liberia says the Liberian opposition would kill without remorse. They've done it for years. Maybe some of those people Henry called friends were not really his friends. Theory number six, last but not least, we come to our bridezilla, Henry's wife, Corrine McCabe. Is that too mean? She seems to be a real piece of work. Corrine had left for California on August 14th, where she told police she was getting ready to move. Henry had apparently mentioned in passing to some people at his job that he'd like to move back to California, where his family was originally from, but hadn't put in his notice or made any moves to start that process. So I find it unlikely that he was getting ready to move anytime soon. Do I smell divorce in the air? According to her own statement, Corrine had been tracking Henry's phone since 2009 and said that he is a chronic cheater. Henry evidently found out about the tracker and had just wiped it from his phone a few days prior to his disappearance, which really pissed her off. She would even go so far as to remote into his phone and set off his alarm to get his attention. Who does that? No trust issues there. And the fact that Henry was found with his phone in one pocket and the battery in the other pocket is totally Henry's M.O. It was not a well-kept secret that he would take the battery out of his phone so that Kareen couldn't track him. It sounds like everyone knew this, except Kareen. And she admits that that day before Henry disappeared, she had been trying to call him and texting some pretty awful things, like she knew he was cheating and he was never gonna pass his CPA exam. Wow, I can't imagine why he didn't return any of her calls that day. Now, just to give you an even better picture of the real Kareen McCabe, we have to divert for a second to talk about Precious. Admittedly, it does seem as if Henry had been stepping out from time to time on Kareen. And one of those steps was with a woman named Precious Lackis. She managed to infuriate Kareen so bad that one day, when Henry stopped over to see Precious, Kareen followed him and confronted both of them in front of Precious's house. Now, what do I know? But it seems to me that in today's world, it takes a special kind of nuts to go that far. This isn't Peyton Place where the weapon of choice is well-placed gossip. People have been shot for far less, so not a woman to mess with. Anyway, back to the club night. Kareen says she didn't actually speak with Henry until he picked up the phone at 1.57 a.m. when she told police that he sounded like he'd been drinking. Now, somehow, she can still check Henry's call log to find out who he's been talking to. So she does, and she sees that he's been talking to his friend JT. And she knows that when he talks to JT, that means it's a club night. So she calls JT. JT says, I was just with him. He's on his way home with William. He's fine. Kareen says, I don't think so. And loops Henry in on a conference call where Henry tells JT, I'm fine. Don't listen to her. I am almost home. But Kareen tells JT, he's not fine. Go find him. But I'm imagining that there was an eye roll. I can't do an eye roll from JT and a whatever, because JT just took Henry at his word and assumed he was fine. 
Corrine says she continued to get calls from Henry, but that it sounded like he was butt dialing her. Really? When's the last time you butt dialed somebody? This is 2015, not 1999. And according to Henry's phone records, she called or texted him at least 10 times between 1.40 and 1228 AM. When did he have time to butt dial her? So let's look at this timeline again. By all accounts, Henry was not at the club at two o'clock when it closed. So let's say they're out of there by about 1.50 AM. The distance from the club to the holiday station is about 3.6 miles or so. So less than a 10 minute drive when you take stoplights and things into account. So that puts them at the gas station at about 1.58 AM where they're captured on the security footage. Perfect. That's when William says he saw Henry head off walking around the gas station, presumably on his way home. But William couldn't remember where exactly Henry lived, so he just assumes he was going in the right direction. Now, JT says that conference call from Corrine came at 2.09 a.m. So Henry was probably walking at the time and should have been a ways down the road toward home already. At three miles an hour, a decent walking speed, that would put him right in the area where his phone last pinged at 2.28 when Corrine received that last harrowing phone call. But what happened after that. During her interview, investigators brought up the fact that call records showed that after Henry left that terrifying voicemail, Corrine never tried to call him back. She said she was tired and went to bed. Seriously, if I had received that phone call from Mr. Inbetween, I wouldn't have slept for days. She goes to bed. But she was back in town from California by September 10th to help in the search for Henry. And one of the first things she does is talk to Minnesota Community Policing Services and ask them to get involved, which they did. The MCPS is actually a private nonprofit organization that acts as a mediator between citizens and law enforcement. And they are the ones who organize many of the searches that were conducted to find Henry. On October 17th, the MCPS even offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to Henry's recovery. But then something happened between the MCPS and Corrine McCabe, and Corrine fired them. According to David Singleton, the chief executive of the MCPS, there were some inconsistencies in Karen McCabe's story. Singleton still believes she might have withheld information. He thinks somebody else was involved in Henry's death, saying, I don't believe that he just wandered that far on his own. And the audio doesn't support the idea that his death is not suspicious. And October 23rd, just six days later, the MCPS rescinds the award because of Corrine's, quote, willingness to mislead the public and this committee, unquote. By October 15th, Two different people had told police that they believed that Corrine was not telling everything that she knew, and both shared stories of her telling them that she had withheld information from the police, and that she knew Henry was alive, but couldn't say how she knew. And there's even audio of her admitting exactly that. I know who my husband would have gone to. The problem is that when I gave that into the information to the police, they messed it up. I don't know where he is. I have an idea where he is, but I can't say to anyone, not even the police. Obviously, she ended up being wrong. But what did she know that she didn't tell police? Clearly, in my opinion, Corrine has some explaining to do. And I hope to God that there are a lot of details that police are holding close to the vest because it seems like there's quite a bit of smoke here and that maybe the police should be going to try to find the fire. I love playing armchair quarterback. And to be honest, there is even more crazy information out there that I truly just don't even know what to do with. Like this letter received by the New Brighton Police Department that was postmarked October 1st from St. Paul that says Henry McCabe his body next to water, partially buried. Need search dogs to find. 
witness who saw burial, scared, female, young, asked to come forward, can remain anonymous and will protect. The letter and envelope was sent to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for analysis, but there's not enough DNA for testing and no fingerprints for comparison. What about that meeting that the confidential informant was set to have with Emmanuel's brother, J.R., to discuss things they couldn't discuss over the phone? Did they meet? And what did the CI know that made him so sure that William killed Henry? Could I get some follow-up questions, please? Let's talk about Henry's phone. Moundsview PD received call logs from the previous 30 days for Henry's phone, and they showed that his phone made a call at 3.26 a.m. on September 7th. So an hour after that crazy voicemail, and his phone called that same number 24 times that day. And then again on September 9th at 1.01 p.m. And again on September 10th at 9.26 a.m. The police served T-Mobile a subpoena for the records for that number. Only to find out that it's the number that T-Mobile users use to call to check their voicemail. So Henry's phone called to check his voicemail 24 times the day he died. Huh? Keep in mind that the creepy voicemail was recorded at 2.28 a.m. on September 7th. So presumably, most of those 24 calls probably came after 2.28 a.m. And then another call another two days later, and another call another day after that. Who checks their voicemail 24 times in 24 hours? And it seems to me that Henry's obviously not in the lake yet, or his phone would have been fried. Kind of some red flags. God's honest truth, I don't even know where to go with this one. I am hoping this is one of those things that the police are keeping from the public to protect the investigation in the future. But in the end, it's all about that voicemail. Some people say that they can hear Henry shouting things related to Liberia, which could certainly be the case. I think Henry's talking to somebody, but I can't understand a thing that's being said. Some say that it sounds like a wild animal attack. Some animals do sound pretty freaky when they get startled or angry, but no wild animal is going to hang around for any length of time, much less two full minutes. Some say it's a call for help from a drowning man or that he's being waterboarded, but both of those options would most likely come with some kind of water sound, either Henry splashing in the lake or water splashing on his face. Not to mention that the coroner found his phone and the battery in different pockets. So if he was drowning, I highly doubt he's going to take the time to remove the battery off his phone and put them in different pockets. Or maybe he was being tased. But a taser shock only lasts 5 to 30 seconds. So again, not long enough for that two minute clip. Whatever the truth is, it's not pleasant. Only two things remain crystal clear. One is that this case will never be solved until somebody puts on either their big girl pants or their big boy pants and comes forward with the missing information that the police are waiting for. And two is that Henry's daughters deserve better. We here at The In-Between wish to give our condolences to Henry's two beautiful daughters and hope that they do not let their father's death keep them from achieving anything their hearts desire. And a big shout out to the missing Enigma for sharing his information, which in this case was crucial for being able to weed out fact from fiction and for sharing the full original two minute voicemail. I will put a link in the description below to his take on the case. So go check that out and check out all of his other amazing missing persons videos. He does an awesome job. And if you are on a missing 411 binge and you want more strange and mysterious disappearances, click here. Be careful out there and we will see you again on The In-Between.